I do have the prime speaking spot right before lunch, so uh, unfortunately, this is, <laughs> I'm going to have to try and micro machines guy this talk because it's actually really long, and I'm sure you would all be very excited if this thing, you know, started running through lunch. So uh, let's get started. I'm going to skip a lot of the jokes and warm up the things that I normally do. And I'm just going to say that uh, thank you for having me here at uh, RubyConf. I am uh, from Portland, Oregon. I used to live here in Kansas City. I worked. I used to work at Cerner, which I think half the people in this room used to work at Cerner. So uh, no surprise there. Uh, I currently work for Mongo HQ, which is uh, if you, any of you have ever used uh, Heroku and have used Mongo with Heroku, chances are you've, you've run across Mongo HQ because we're the um, database as a service providers. I'm also uh, coming out with a book very soon called Seven Databases in Seven Weeks. And uh, <laughs> I, if any of you are at Rails Comp, I think I said the same thing. And I'm like, oh, it's coming out at the end of the summer. But it turns out writing a book is a much more arduous process than, than uh, one would think. So, but it is uh, coming out of beta uh, November 30th. So uh, look for that. So, the thing that I wanted to talk about is just sort of an uh, overarching view. We've only got about 30 minutes to go over this, and unfortunately, it's not one of those topics that's uh, best condensed in, in such a small thing in uh, the, the, the level of detail that I would really love to go over, especially considering that this is a Ruby conference. Uh, there's going to be some Ruby code, and I will make this as Ruby-centric as possible, but uh, more importantly, uh, I want everybody, hopefully, to be able to walk away with at least a, a, a good sort of 30,000 foot understanding of uh, a lot of the things that are going on in the database world right now. And there are copious amounts. And uh, you, if you've ever listened to or read anything about uh, the NoSQL databases, you'll sort of hear the big four uh, graph databases, columnar databases, key value, or document data store. Uh, that's fine, uh, but then I you know, enjoy throwing in relational, so there's really five, because let's not forget the, <laughs> the, the databases that all of us have been using for the past 40 years. Um, so real quick, just talk about the ecosystem. Uh, and this map, I think, is a great example of why it's easy to get lost in the databases that are out there. And this is by far, in a way, not comprehensive. Uh, but it does a really good job of, of breaking down sort of the, the groupings and the classifications of, of databases that are out there. Um, we're going to cover these. Uh, and there's several reasons. The, the ones that are in orange are the open source databases. So I, I only really want to talk about the open source databases. Uh, there's several closed source ones out there. There's ones that are specifically uh, only as a service, like App Engine and, and uh, Amazon RDS and things like that. And you know, those are fine, but uh, you know, let's 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 stick with with the code that we can read. So just a quick history um, on these databases. This is sort of a map of the ones that we're we're pretty much going to cover. If you notice at the very top, you zoom in. Uh, it, it kind of started around 2006, this whole big sort of uh, database movement. I mean, up until that point, things were more or less relational databases were king. So it is, it is still a really uh, new, modern thing. And if you look up there at the very top, this, this is a, a Google project called Megastore. And it is just out like now. I mean, it's only internal to Google. But there's, there's new databases that are popping up. Uh, Voldemort, Redis, those things really only came around in 2009, and it's amazing in the past two years how uh, they've become almost considered standard, uh, which, is, which is a pretty amazing thing for an industry that has more or less been stagnant for the past 40 years. Um, so I, I, I should notice it up the top, it's a, it's a little corner, it says like big tables, uh, down at the bottom it says key value, and these are grouped in the different type, big table, is, is the Google implementation that a lot of these databases like HBase and Hypertable and Cassandra have, have, have spawned off of. Uh, we like to call them columnar data stores because of the, the, the way they store data. And I'll explain why for that nomenclature. Uh, document data stores, all the big ones that people are, are probably aware of. Couch, DB, uh, Mongo, uh, uh, Mongo HQ, you know, as it, a provider. 
uh, that spawn up that Mongo machines and other one Mongo labs, all of that. And then uh, graph data store. Um, there's several out there. Uh, graph DB and Neo for J, in my opinion, are pretty much the only ones worth looking at. Um, there's other ones like uh, Twitter has their own called Flock DB that, you know, unless you're Twitter, I don't think you're going to find much use for. So these are the selections of the database we're going to cover. Uh, so let's start with the relational models. Uh, here's a few of the open source relational databases. Uh, Postgres, MySQL, I mean, you, you're pretty much familiar with most of these, almost anyone in this room. Um, and, and by the way, if I'm going too fast, I, I am going to have these slides available for download. So you don't need to be scribbling to write these down. Um, but uh, these are a lot of the really good Ruby drivers that uh, I would recommend if you're using any of these databases. Um, the difference, a lot of people are saying, well, you know, why would you use Postgres over MySQL? Well, I mean, this is, this is a fight that's been going on for, for 15 years now. Um, the way that I like to split them up is that, that Postgres is, is fine. It, it, Postgres is fantastic if you want sort of an academically focused database. If you want a database that sort of came from the world of database research, not as interested in speed as much as correctness. And I'm not saying it's slow at all, I, but, but like they're, 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 uh, Postgres is, is very much about being modular and being able to plug in. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, database indexing at all, they, they, uh, you, can, you can write your own custom indexes on their framework called GIS, which is a generalized index search, uh, search tree index. Um, this is something that MySQL was not concerned with at all. If from the very beginning. They, again, as, as all open source projects go over time, they're sort of reaching a parity. So there's not a huge difference between them, but the, the groups of people are, are, are very different. And as we all know, uh, the community is actually, you know, can be very important. Uh, MySQL uh, is, is what I recommend if you want something lighter, if you don't need um, a lot of the, the details that that Postgres provides, like for the example, like make you know, if you're not writing your own custom uh, indexing and writing your own really custom uh, data structures and, and all of that, MySQL is fantastic. Drizzle uh, split off of MySQL um, project. Uh, I guess there was some political or technical reasons. I'm not entirely sure why they split off, but uh, it's it's a it's a lighter version of uh, of MySQL. Um, VoltDB is is a relative newcomer in this relational database space, and it's really focused on uh, scalability. I mean, it, it it has a lot of built-in support for like auto sharding and things like this, so you can distribute your uh, relational database out. Um, one thing, and this, this is just a note, just because of the crowd that I like to say, uh, don't get obsessed with this whole ORM thing. The whole object relational mapper is fantastic. I mean, I love Active Record. I love ARel. I love ARel. One of the problems is this can get to be almost a little religious in the fact that uh, the idea that you can't write SQL in code. Is, is, is just absurd. SQL is a fantastic language, and I think one of the um, best arguments for why it's fantastic is it's been around for ages and uh, relatively unchanged. I mean, it's actually uh, one of the longest, oldest languages that is still actively used all of the time. And it's because it's a very powerful uh, mechanism for, for querying and, and, and deciphering data. And, uh, I got an argument with someone at RailsConf about this kind of query, uh, how you could, you could definitely write an ARAL wrapper uh, around these functions. And I'm like, but to what point? It doesn't make it any more portable because these functions only work in Postgres. And beyond that, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really make it any clearer than this. I mean, okay, this might, if you're not a SQL person, this might not uh, be clear, but that's sort of a bunk argument because I could look at any language that I don't know and say, oh, yeah, that's, th this doesn't make any sense just because I don't know it. But what this does is uh, finds the, the shortest uh, distance uh, object within a bounding cube in uh, three dimensional space, which, all right. I, and that actually makes me really excited. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I used to do research in, in, in high dimensional database indexing. so. But that's all I'm really going to say uh, about relational databases because it's something we all know pretty well. Uh, big table columnar 
slash polymer data stores. Uh, uh, HBase, Hypertable, Cassandra. Cassandra is sort of a weird little anomaly here, um, but it is technically a column-based data store. Uh, HBase is what I would say is probably the most true to the big table concept. Big table is, if you're not familiar, excuse me, the data store that Google invented uh, about 10 years ago in order to deal with their massive amount of data that they have. And here are some, some good drivers to you. Uh, I, I, I find Stargate hit or miss because it, uses, it goes through the REST interface. And if you're doing big table, you're really looking for sort of the massively scalable, high throughput uh, systems. So I, I actually recommend using Thrift. And I believe Thrift was a project created by Facebook. The neat thing about Thrift is that all of these column-oriented data stores um, have Thrift interfaces. So it, you can, in a very real sense, so, so Thrift is almost sort of like a, an ORM for column-oriented data stores so that you can uh, you know, write your full Thrift-based code and you know, write your Thrift-based hooks. And there's a lot of similarity between them. Um, Hypertable is kind of neat because it's got this little HQL, so it's a lot more queryable. Uh, I, I, I don't think that its community, it, it's sort of, you know, has corporate backed things. It, it doesn't have sort of the, the mind share that, that HBase does. HBase is a Java based project, though, and that does rub some people the wrong way. Um, Cassandra is a hybrid, and I'll explain what that means when, when we get on to uh, uh, talking about React. But in a nutshell, I guess, I guess I'll just explain it right now, is that um, uh, there was another big data store created by Amazon called Dynamo. And uh, Cassandra sort of took the architecture of Dynamo and it took the column-oriented interface of uh, Big Table and mashed them together. And this was created by Facebook. And they thought this was a fantastic idea until they started having problems with the architecture. So they're actually moving a lot of uh, their code, uh, especially like their, their messaging system and everything, over to HBase. Um, I, I don't not recommend Cassandra because unless you're you know, Facebook scale or something, it, you're probably not going to run into the problems that they have. But um, you know, I, I'm, I'm more of the mind of you know, if you want to use Dynamo Data Store, you, you know, use something like React. If you want to use a column or Data Store, use something like HBase. That I, I don't understand the point of the hybrid at all. So. When I'm talking about con columns, though, I keep throwing out these terms. And I, I know they get confusing, especially if you're from a relational world uh, where columns mean something and rows mean something. Column-oriented data store, uh, rather than you know, in a table in a relational database where you might have a person table, and then you have a name and a social security number, and then they're all stored together. They're clumped together in rows. Uh, Column-oriented data storage flips it on its head and it actually stores data in columns. Now, you might say, well, what's the point of this? There's actually several benefits to this. One of the big ones is the fact that if you have uh, multiple uh, data centers and you have multiple systems, you can, you can actually even put columns you know, in, in subsystems that are dedicated to uh, uh, being optimized for dealing with that sort of data. Uh, think about it in terms of Google, because they, you know, they created it, uh, where they have this giant data store that is uh, dealing with us, you know, scanning web pages and things like that, uh, where you might have one column uh, dedicated to holding the titles of a page and another column dedicated to uh, ver you know, versioning all of the details of a page. Uh, you might want those in, in, in you know, two sort of different contexts, because the title of a page won't change very often, whereas the, the contents of the page might change very often. And so it sort of has this built-in version control. So a row is, is sort of an amorphous thing where you say, OK, uh, you know, give me the most recent version of the title, and then give me this version of the, the page body. And then it, it uh, uh, clumps them all together, and then that is sort of a row. <coughs> but the nice thing is that you know, all, all these commonly data stores have this built-in um, built uh, version control thing. I highly recommend using you know, for something like a wiki. And here's some, some Ruby code. I'm not going to go over uh, too much about it, but uh, you can tell by this, this Apache line 3 include Apache Hadoop HBase Thrift. This was created by Java people. So you <laughs> sort of got this you know, nested namespace. Uh, but uh, I'm going to have this code available too. But this is just a real simple uh, wrapper so that you, you can then execute 
code was then thripped and it connects <coughs> to the server. Uh, this was a wiki, uh, but uh, you, you still need to do migrations in the same way that you would do migrations for um, a relational database. <coughs> Uh, you know, here is replicating all, where you have the scanner and it opens up. And the, the thing about a column-oriented data store, I should also mention, is the fact that all the keys are in order. So it's really fantastic for for doing anything that you need to scan data. Again, uh, it makes sense in a search engine like Google because they key everything uh, in reverse nomenclature uh, uh, URLs. So you'll have. Uh, com.google.maps, which is right beside com.google.www and com.google.zzz, whatever. And so they're in order. So if they just say, okay, well, give me all of the data about com.google, you can easily just start at the beginning and then just start scanning. And then once Google's done, you stop scanning. Um, yeah, implementation, implementation. Uh, here's a you know, way to get historical versions because, as I said, it has a built-in version control, and you can you can set timeouts on these versions as well and say, okay, I only I only want uh, this data to live for this amount of time, or say I only want to store the last five records. So use Thrift; they all implement. Um, H, I think we I think we covered some of the H-based benefits. Uh, Cassandra has some benefits. It's you know it's it's it's, it's configurable because of its architecture uh, to be as consistent or available as you want. And uh, I'll talk about that when we get to this sort of dynamo of the style. Um, document data store. If any of you have ever used a uh, NoSQL database, it's probably going to be a document data store. It's probably have been uh, MongoDB or, or CouchDB. Uh, there's another one called RavenDB. Um, I got to say, I, I'm. If any of you are aware of a Ruby driver for RavenDB, that would be fantastic because I, I could not find one. Uh, one thing that should be mentioned, though, is that RubyDB is written in .NET. So I think that's part of the reason it hasn't sort of gotten very popular in, in you know, this sort of community. Um, but uh, I, I imagine it's a pretty fantastic uh, data store. Mongo and Couch, though, is what we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, if you're not familiar, this is a document. Uh, unlike the previous two we saw, unlike relational, unlike column-oriented data store, you don't migrate anything with the document data store. Uh, you, you just stick values in. Now, you might wonder what the value of that. A lot of, that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. The idea that you can just add fields or not have fields willy-nilly. Um, and it, I, I think it runs on this principle. The schemes are pretty awesome until they're not. And it's when you're creating new projects, a lot of times you have no idea how it's actually going to end up. You know, you start off writing a pet shop application, and then two years later, it's a social network for dogs. You just, uh, I, I, and, and I always love cell phones as a great example of something that isn't necessarily used in the way that it was originally envisioned to be used. The number two use of a cell phone is text messaging. Are there any guesses at what the number one use of a cell phone is? Checking the time. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I think, I think I, you know, like making phone calls might be number three, but I think that's even moving on to number four after playing Angry Birds. <laughs> and, um, so uh, the, the, the document principle just accepts this as a reality. Now, um, the difference between Mongo and, and Couch, uh, Mongo was built from the ground up to be huge, scalable data sets. Um, that, that, that's originally what it was built for. Uh, it really wasn't concerned about durability because the, uh, of an individual data store because the idea was, well, if one of them crashes, it doesn't matter because it will, you know, just, it'll just go to a different instance while we reboot that server and then all will be good. Um, so it, it does auto sharding and, and all of this based off this configuration. It has this really simple way to interface through this service called Mongo S uh, that sort of handles the, the routing of, of all of your requests to the direct to the correct um, uh, server uh, replica sets. But um, it, it can be a bear to set up. Couch, 
Uh, the one, one thing I should also mention about uh, uh, Mongo as well is that it, it does ad hoc queries. If you're familiar with SQL and you like dealing in that sort of environment where you just stick in data and you say, okay, I want to grab this value and uh, uh, you know, with this query, Mongo is the way to go. Couch, on the other hand, has a very heavy reliance on MapReduce. And what you do is you run these MapReduce functions and you create views and you grab data. And I know there's a lot of tools to help uh, facilitate that, but under the covers, that's pretty much uh, what it does. Um, it was originally built to be very, very durable. So what I would say is, you know, if, if you were building, you know, uh, something like a, a clinic in um, uh, Uganda or something, uh, use Couch. Don't don't try to connect to some Mongo data center somewhere. Uh, just install Couch because it's it's very federated in the fact that you'll have couch, an instance of Couch on one device and an instance of Couch on another device and an instance of Couch on another device. And uh, they'll sync up eventually because they have this, this really amazing master-master replication, which is something that Mongo does not have. Mongo is very master-slave replication-centric. Um, but there, are, there have been some attempts to uh, make Couch a lot more um, uh, light, a, a, lot, a, a lot more similar to Mongo. And the, the first attempt was Lounge. Um, I know it's a, lot, a lot of people still use Lounge. Uh, but it's quickly being overtaken by this, which is called Big Couch. And I would generally recommend Big Couch if you're starting from scratch and you want, you, you want to create a, a cluster. But Couch is you know, pretty simple. You, you start up Couch, and the whole thing is REST-based. It's just REST interactions. It's like uh, you, you, you put values in it, and you get values out. You use it, it, HTTP URLs. That's uh, where all the data is in, and again, it stores documents and gives them back and forth. It also has a pretty classy interface. I like Couch's interface. This is Mongo's interface. It's not quite as sexy, but to be honest, don't let this fool you. It's, it's not really as powerful as, as you would hope, but uh, it's you know, a little more powerful than this. Um, so I, I threw out the term MapReduce. I, I did want to show kind of the idea of what MapReduce is. This is a... Um, is this, I believe this is a Mongo MapReduce. Um, th it's in JavaScript Couch, and Mongo are both very heavily JavaScript-centric. Um, if you have a little trouble reading this, then let's look at it in Ruby. Really quickly. Uh, actually, I think this is a little more of a Rails kind of a thing, but uh, if you're familiar with the very first line, get all rooms. So imagine you just have a hotel, and you have rooms in it, so get them all. Step two is, is called mapping. And what you, when you map, you take an array of some values and you convert them into an array of something else. And that's exactly what this is doing. If you're familiar with the map command, all it's doing is it's just saying, you know, out of all of the, the, the rooms, extract the capacity of every room and then put it into this array called caps. And there's a, this real shortcut that you might be much more familiar with, where it's, uh, you know, you do, do map and then uh, ampersand symbol of capacity. And then starting with zero on reduce, th these, are, these are all real Ruby functions. They've been there since day one. Um, you can then add the capacity <coughs> of every single item in the room, or, or sorry, every single uh, capacity of every room, and then the result is the total of the capacity out of your entire hotel. Now, you might wonder what the point of doing all of that is when you could have just iterated through and added them together. And it's because of this. It's because you can split that array, uh, that, the, 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 that mapped array, can a little part of each map can be done on a different server. And then they can be reduced on different servers. And then they can be re-reduced. And then finally, you end up with one single result. And it, it, it works on the idea that it's much cheaper when you have these massive data systems, uh, so these, these very uh, federated, distributed systems. Uh, it's cheaper to send the algorithm out to the data than it is to pull the data to you and then perform some function on it. So Mongo versus Cabbage, we, uh, we talked about this a bit. Um, uh, I, I would say again, if you're if, if you're not familiar and you're not comfortable with MapReduce, I would try out Mongo first because you can you can quickly delve into the. To, and, and I'm not saying that Mongo doesn't support MapReduce; it does, but that's not really its primary uh, mode. That was some, something they sort of tacked on at the end. Um, 
But uh, if, if you need something that's really durable and you need something that you want to embed, because you can embed couch in anything. I, mean, I think there's even a couch for Android. Uh, and it works really well. You know, you stick your little, you stick your little couch instance inside of all these cell phones, and then they sync up to the cluster eventually. This is something that Mongo has a very difficult time with. And then what about Raven? And it's it's, it's .NET, so I'll just you know. <laughs> uh, key value, um, key value stores are sort of not very sexy, but uh, I, I I hope you'll see uh, React and Redis will hopefully change your mind on this. Um, React, and, and I kept talking about the Dynamo uh, implementation by Amazon. React is a very good, faithful implementation of, of Dynamo with a bunch of other awesome things like vector clocks and things like that for dealing with versioning. Um, Ripple is really good. There, there's this uh, ORM called Risky. I don't know why it calls it ORM, because ORM stands for Object Relational Mapper, and there's nothing relational about this in any way. But um, one of the uh, 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 you know big use cases that people use React is, uh, is uh, um, uh, secondary indexes. Um, they use them for uh, caching, uh, second level caching. Um, and things like sessions, you know, any, any data, just that you would use a normal key value store for. But the nice thing um, about React is that, you know, again, and this should look familiar. This is just like Big Couch, sort of the same, uh, uh, same server setup where where you have uh, your nodes. This is this is this is called a consistent hashing. Uh, if you're familiar with this concept, and the idea is that nodes can come up and down and you don't have to rehash the entire system. Just part of it. Um, I, I didn't talk about CAP, but the CAP theorem in, in a nutshell is that uh, this idea that you, your server can be consistent, it can be available, it can be partition tolerant, but you can only have two. It's, it's, it's impossible to make a system that is, that is completely partition tolerant, completely available, and completely consistent. Uh, so it can't be beaten, it's just a rule. But it can be tweaked, and what uh, React is has, has uh, sort of pioneered. I don't know if they pioneered the Dynamo pioneered it, but in the open source world, they they really took it and ran with it. Is this idea that even though it can't be tweaked, it can be it can be or it can't be beaten, it can be tweaked. The idea that you can have parts of your system that are really consistent, but not as available if it's really important data like billing data or anything like that, uh, and then you can have parts of your system that are highly available. Not as consistent, but it's not as important necessarily be like you know, session information. Um, and you know, we can go over you know, some of the details on how, and I've got these on the slides. Um, other key value stores, uh, memcache is fast. You don't need to use it. Uh, Kyoto cabinet, really durable, it's awesome. You don't need to use it. Redis. Is amazing. It's fast. It's durable. It's it's it, it's also uh, uh, allows for multiple data structures. I mean, Memcache, Kyoto Cabinet, these things aren't built for multiple data structures. They're built for um, uh, you know, holding strings. Uh, Redis, uh, on the other hand, can uh, do all sorts of things. So you, you can store lists. You can store data structures like lists, where you just keep pushing so that. The first command is, is called push, uh, R push, push things into the right. Uh, lunch is the key, and then pizza is the value. So you can start pushing things in. So here, it's like, OK, I want to push in pizza to lunch. I want to push in pie to lunch. I want to push in juice to lunch. And then you know, give me the range just of the first two, and then it returns it. So you can do the almost kind of little sub-queries on something, which is pretty powerful. If you've ever used uh, uh, memcast, there's nothing like it. Uh, it. It can store hashes in the same way. Um, and it can store sets. And what's neat about when it stores sets it can do set, is it can do set operations. So here, I'm adding two people to the set. Uh, I'm adding uh, a one of the names to a different set. And then the very bottom command is the intersection. I'm saying, give me the intersection of all values that are in both sets. And you can do unions, and you can do you know, all this you know, pretty, pretty advanced. Uh, you can do publish subscribe systems using Redis, uh, where you fire up one client. And, uh, publish things out, and then you can have multiple clients subscribe to that, and then they'll all get the, the data at the same time. On top of all that, Redis is actually pretty fast. Um, so I've got about one minute left to go over graph databases. Uh, so Neo4j, FlockDB, 
uh, graph DB, you pretty much skip flock. Neo4j is the one that I highly recommend if you really want to play with it. Um, but the idea of a, of a graph DB is exactly what it sounds. It stores data in, in graphs. Each of these would be a node, and they link to each other in different ways. This is the, a graph of you know, the, the movie The Matrix and how the people uh, uh, are connected to each other. Uh, Neo4j is actually fantastic. It's also kind of hard to get uh, a grep on originally because there's way many ways to communicate with it. Uh, I prefer Gremlin. This is Gremlin. Gremlin is a um, groovy uh, based language. Uh, it's kind of esoteric. But if you don't want to run Java and you want to run Ruby, then there is a REST interface that can execute Ruby scripts in the back back end. So if you see the line uh, in the middle that says script, that's actually Groovy, and it's just passing that in to REST. So you can have your cool little Rails app and then just have that Groovy that has Java. You don't need to install Java anywhere else, which, you know, it, unless you wanted to. FlockDB, yeah, is fine. I'd check it out. But uh, finally, I would just say just try them all. It's uh, 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 really easy to get started, especially if you have a Mac or something, because you can install every database I talked about here uh, you, you, through Peru. So uh, try and run it. Here's just a real quick uh, sheet, the, the, very, the very far left side. Far right side is uh, some examples of things that you might want to use these databases for in particular. Uh, this is sites, this is the papers you should read. And yeah, apparently that's it. But I will have all these slides available for download. Uh, we'll have them on the website. And I uh, hope that didn't go too long. I don't know if you guys had any questions, because I, I think we're actually four minutes long. And I don't want to stop anyone from having delicious lunch. <laughs> Where are we going to get these slides at on the website? Uh, I, I'm going to give them to the organizers and they will post them on the website. Also, if you check on my Twitter feed, I'll, I'll tweet about it at Kota Roshi. Okay. Uh, also, oh, I forgot. I, I have this amazing t-shirt. So I was going to give it to anyone who asked the best question. <laughs> uh, Can I have your shirt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's good. Yeah, popular vote. You win. That's question. Are there any other questions, though? Um, things in trying to evaluate the databases is a lot of these databases discuss durability, but I kind of question that. For instance, my understanding is VoltDB achieves its speed by just staying in memory. I'm and sorry, what was that? My understanding about dur durability, like for VoltDB, is that it just keeps everything in memory, and the whole goal is not to have the entire cluster go down. Do you mm. dis discuss? Issues about yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there will always be a trade-off. The more durable you want something, the slower it's going to be. I mean, that's just it's it's like physics. I mean, because you're you're writing something to disk or 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 storing it in a in a in a secondary system. So so the more durable you want it, the, the, the slower it's going to be. Um, I think Redis is probably one of the purest examples of that, where. Um, it is it just like well, it stores everything in main memory, uh, and then occasionally forks and writes a, a clone to disk. Um, and you can increase. You, you can have um, a, a uh, sort of a, a system of record, right? Or sorry, a write file uh, where every command is is written to this file, and that's definitely more durable. But if you're if you're literally writing every single command to disk, obviously you're not going to get the hundred thousand writes a second that you would normally get if you're just dealing with main memory. Um, I, I will say, as far as durability, uh, Couch is actually probably one of the, the more durable databases. And I'm not even a Couch fanboy. I I, guess I, I work for Mongo HQ, so in the document data store world, I should be a bigger Mongo fan, which which I am for certain use cases, but. Uh, uh, Couch is actually fantastic because of the way that, that it just streams all rights to records. It doesn't do inline updates. It just, when you add more values, it just appends into the end of the file. And what's fantastic about that is if the system crashes in the middle of a write uh, and you boot the system back up, it's just going to look at an incomplete write and be like, oh well, and then it's going to continue on. So you're not going to ever get corrupted data. Uh, 
but there, there's, I mean, if you need something super consistent, that's when I would do, you know, something like Postgres or something with some sort of acid locking. Um, again, you know, one of the things about Volt is, right, you, you can't be ultra durable because it's, it's very diff difficult to be consistent. You can't be consistent and available when you're partitioning in the way that you're uh, partitioning in, in Volt. Um, and I would really love to explain to anybody that's interested in why the cat theorem is the case. I just sort of just, just declare my fiat that it is a fact. Um, but it's, it's, that's a big like 15 minute discussion in amongst itself. Sounds like a great lunch discussion. Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right, thank you very much, Eric. Thank you.